time that we checked, what was he up to? What was his situation in life? Was he having a good time? Was he like uh, on the French Riviera gambling? Or Oh, wrong time period, but he was in prison. Right. Why was he in prison? Because he was enslaved and he was a slave. And even though he was very, he, he, he excelled in what he did, his owner's wife said, hey, this guy was trying to make the moves on me. And so he's in jail, right? And he still is in jail, right? And that's where we find ourselves in the intro. In the dark confines of his cell, boom, boom. Joseph languished. His accurate prophecies, the cupbearer's freedom, and the banker's execution came to pass. However, bum bum, the cupbearer's memory of Joseph faded upon his release from prison. Meaning what? He's still sitting there. Even though the jailer really likes him and he's the jailer saying, hey, help me manage the, you know, the, this rascal, scurrilous lot of prisoners. A shift in Joseph's fate awaits. From a dreary dungeon, he will ascend to the zenith of Egypt's power structure. His rise will not be accidental. Divine intervention will play a part, meaning God's hand is in the thick of all this. Okay, endowed with a God gift, dream, uh, God, in, with a God given gift of dream interpretation and the vision to foresee a devastating famine, Joseph will become Egypt's rescuer. God used 13 years to prepare him for this monumental task. Those years tested and strengthened his faith and honed his skills. No other Egyptian will have the same qualifications to rescue Egypt, but also the world through Jacob's lineage of the promised Messiah. Now, if you were to interview Jacob, he probably would say, you know, I would rather have an easier life where I wasn't forced to acquire some of these skills, right? But, you know, but... The events in life really brought him into a lot of different situations where, okay, he learned a lot about Egypt, lower class, upper classes, the entire society. Okay. Uh, shaped by both adversity and divine favor, Joseph is ready. Drum roll, please. Chapter 41. Okay. All right. So after two whole years, okay, so what's the after part? Yes, two whole years, meaning not one year and one month, and now we're in the second year, but a goodly number of months, okay? After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up by the seven plump full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Okay, so Pharaoh's living in in a culture where dreams can carry import, but that's not weird, is it? Because we've seen that throughout the history of Israel that's being recorded so far, right? That God uses these sorts of things at times. And so would you find it surprising that God is somehow doing this though Pharaoh is not a believer? No, because God is working through situations for a particular outcome, okay? So, and this purely maybe, maybe God had nothing to do with it, but he will use this. We don't know, at least right now, okay? 
But that's the setup, and Pharaoh's disturbed because this is a disturbing dream, but he doesn't know its meaning or whether he should even pay any attention to it. So that's where he is. And so he calls the different people around him who may be able to help him make sense of this. Right? And why do you think, let's just consider this from a purely human perspective. Why would it matter that someone might be around to help you make sense of what you may dream? What often takes place in our dreams? If a lot of times we're working through stuff, right? And so, I mean, this has happened on many occasions where I've dreamt and fallen asleep and I'll wake up and I'll go, that's what I need to do in the sermon. So when I'm asleep, my brain was working on something. And then when I awoke, it was like, oh yeah, because there was something that just didn't try quite transition right or I wasn't sure how to describe a particular point and you wake up and, you know, and maybe you guys might say, maybe you need to sleep a lot more, Pastor. <laughs> so anyway, so there it is. So Pharaoh is left wanting, okay? Let's continue on. If you remember Joseph's life, what will happen next won't be a surprise. Okay? So we'll look at verses 9 through 13. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me on, and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. Isn't it weird that he says a servant of the captain of the guard? He wasn't a servant, but he was esteemed enough where, right? So it's interesting that the cupbearer says this. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Okay. So let's think about the different things that are going on and how much time has elapsed. So tying in to verse 1, how much longer was Joseph in prison after he had originally interpreted the cupbearer's dream? Two whole years, right. So meaning two years, maybe a little bit more, maybe a bit, little bit less, but it was, right, it's close enough to two years where you could, you could say that it was, yeah, the entire time. How would you feel after two years in prison? Would you have lifted Joseph's spirit during this time of being forgotten? Or what could have lifted, even seemingly by God? So, I mean, how long when you're there? It's like, oh man, the cupbearer, yeah, he said he's gonna remember me. And then I think after a month or two, you would go, ain't gonna happen, right? You think, oh, well, how long is it gonna take for the bureaucracy to work? Of course, when you have one leader, right? In a sense, you can get things done faster if you want, right? You don't have this entire, there's this bureaucracy, but if he's the cupbearer, he, he sees Pharaoh every day, okay? Part of his job is to, you know, bring his meals, eat the food and taste the drink, to, so that way if it's poisoned, he's gonna suffer first, okay? So, yeah, yeah. So what does verse 13 tell us about Joseph as a prophet, which was the last verse? This is what he said. He interpreted the dreams, and what did the cupbearer say? Hey, it happened. The other guy was hanged, and I was set free. Okay, well, if Joseph's short-term prophecies were true, okay, let's, let's go back to, like, some other stuff, right? then what does that imply, or what can we infer if we don't think the implication is there, concerning his long-term prophecies, right? Such as what? Wheats of stock bowing down before him, so on and so forth, right? He had a couple of dreams, at least a couple that were recorded, right? And 
that hasn't happened. But who else had a couple of dreams, at least as recorded? Pharaoh. So, if Joseph understands and interprets these two dreams properly, that's even more cemented in our minds that those two dreams that he had earlier should come to pass. Does that make sense? Of course we know it will. But I'm just, I'm just saying, even if we kind of look at that from kind of a, just a skeptic's eye, you know, the narrative is all there for us to kind of connect the dots this way. Okay. So let's press on. Okay. So now Pharaoh's disturbed. He has, he's had this couplet of dreams and nobody could help him. Okay. So, but he knows of someone who may be able to help him. So we continue on. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. This is a little weird cultural thing, right? He shaved himself and put on his clothes. So Egypt is a particular culture where, right, if you're a man of standing, you would be clean shaven. And possibly even your, the head of your hair could be shaved. Okay, so not like uh, a lot of other cultures, you know, around the Middle East where, you know, you'd have a beard and whatnot. So this right here lets us know that Joseph is doing the proper thing for an Egyptian. Okay, we may not catch that, but there it is. Okay. Um, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So right there, what is he saying? If I'm able to interpret it, it's not really me. It's God through me. So in a sense, he's being humble here, isn't he? Yeah, he doesn't want to take credit for saying, it. oh yeah, look at me, look what I could do. He's saying, oh, it's not me. Okay. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed on the grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in the land of Egypt. Basically, exactly what was written before, with a little bit of narrative. And that's pretty much what's happening here. Okay. And thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up to seven good ears. Well, I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. So there we have it. So is, Her is, Her is Pharaoh having an issue with this? Yes, he's bothered enough by it that what? He actually takes the cupbearer's advice and says, well, haul this guy out of prison because nobody here around me can give me, can make sense of this, at least to my satisfaction. Let's see if this guy is any better. Of course, after talking to Joseph, he knows that if Joseph is able to do it, Joseph will say, well, it's not me, but it's my God who has given me this ability, or God is doing it through me. Okay, so let's, let's hear, this, let's hear uh, my, my rendition of the dream, because it lacks a little punch in the English, okay? I was standing by the lip of the Nile, and look, out of the Nile emerged seven cows, fat of flesh and full in form, gazing in the rushes. And look, seven more cows appeared, lank and foul-featured in form and flesh. I have not seen their like in the entire land of Egypt. These lank and sickly cows devoured the, devoured the first seven fat ones and were taken into their bellies. But you would not know that for their appearance remained as foul as before. This startled me awake, 
and look, seven years of grain sprouted on a single stalk, whole and sound, and look, seven withered ears scorched by the east wind sprouted after them. These withered ears swallowed up the seven good ears. So, with a little bit of narrative, pretty much Pharaoh just said what he dreamt. And he's laying it before Joseph. So let's see if Joseph can make sense of this and whether Pharaoh will buy it or not, right? I mean, Pharaoh's the leader of Egypt. And Joseph could be correct, but Pharaoh could still say, I don't like it. I don't think that's what it is. Because how are you going to know if it's true or not? Well, whatever he says is the meaning of the dream will have to come to pass. But before that, Pharaoh has to be convinced that Joseph can interpret this properly, okay, or decipher it. Let's look at the next few verses, 25 through 32. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. So he's having two dreams, but what is Joseph saying? Right, they're describing the same event, or they're pointing to the same thing, though they are two different dreams. Okay? God has revealed this to Pharaoh, what he is about to do. So earlier, we said, oh, we, we, we discussed, the po or I mentioned the possibility that God could be doing this, or it could just be happening. Now what does Joseph reveal? Well, you had these dreams, and they're your own, but what? God has revealed to Pharaoh. So right there, the same God who allows me to interpret dreams, dreams has worked through whatever mechanisms he has chosen to cause this to happen in your dreams. So right there, if Pharaoh says, okay, then he's going to believe Joseph's interpretation. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's continue on. Oh, uh, we do have more lessons here. Here we go. Oh, you do? Okay. So, uh, where were we? Okay. So now he's, going to, now he's going to explain what the images in Pharaoh's dreams mean. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. So, yeah, you can go, that makes sense, because in a famine, what will happen to the cattle? Oh, yeah, the, they're not going to be looking good, because they'll be short of water and food, and many will die. What about your crop? Well, if you harvest a crop, it will be much less, right? Because you won't have the rain that you need. Um, it is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty. Notice great plenty. Okay? Throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will be arise seven years of famine and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. It could be, if my reading of history is correct, that in the 20s in, the, in our nation, a hundred years ago, it was a time of great prosperity. And nobody knew that in 1929, the bottom will fall out. And we had many years of poor economic of hard, we had hard times. And what ended up happening is a lot of things ended up happening where it made it even worse, okay? Um, the famine will continue. Well, the famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow. For it will be very severe, okay? So I grew up in a time when I remember some old people who would hoard stuff and I'm like, man, but, you know, these were people who were greatly impacted by the Great Depression. And so, you know, down in the basement or the cellar or where there's all this stuff. Well, you know, there could be another depression. And there you are. I mean, my mom was, 
She used to tell me when I was growing up, we had, she always had lots of food. Well, you never know if war's going to come. She was a child during World War II, and she experienced hunger. So for her, it was like, well, we better have it because you just don't know. Of course, you know, I, I was a kid. I never went through war. I just thought my mom was nuts because I didn't have a, you know. Okay, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Two dreams. That way you can be doubly certain that this will happen. Hmm. What do you think? Pharaoh's going to say, get out of here, you, you scalawag. <laughs> or is he going to go, well, that actually that makes more sense than what any, anybody else has said. Right? I mean, the imagery, cattle and grain, that makes perfect sense for a famine. But he wasn't able to tie those things together. And neither were kind of his, his best advisors around him. Okay? So, the two dreams tell the same story and are fixed in the divine plan. Within the broader context of Genesis, this statement implies that Joseph, Joseph's dreams, doubly attested, are doubly sure. If we remember those earlier dreams, they should come to pass. Okay? But first, well, there has to be the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. The thing is, the seven years of plenty will be so good that what? Probably after the third year, pfft, famine, pfft, no way, right? Because the abundance will be so great, you know, that who knows? Ah, too much grain, I'll just compost it. <laughs> or whatever, who knows what happens, right? So, yeah, so it's was very easy for the people to become complacent and just think, after a few years, this becomes the new normal until you realize the new normal is not that normal. Like, interest rates at 2%, <laughs> Sure, it's going to be this way forever. I'll get an adjustable rate mortgage for my home. And then you realize these historic lows are historically low and are not the norm. Okay, all right. So, there we have it. Joseph has laid it on the line. Now let's see what's going to happen with Pharaoh because we need Pharaoh's response, do we not? That's the next few verses. Are we, all, are we all on board so far? Okay, verses 33 through 36. Now therefore, let Pharaoh, this is Joseph still speaking. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Is Joseph saying it should be him? No. And, well, you could write... I mean, think about this. It doesn't have to be him. Can you not be a doctor and diagnose something, but that doesn't mean that you know how to cure it? Oh, wow. You have cancer, but you better go see the cancer doctor. Okay? So, but he's saying, let Pharaoh proceed, etc., etc., and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the, the cities and let them keep it that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. Well, if you're Pharaoh, it's like, oh, there's going to be seven years of plenty. After the first couple of years, won't you have a pretty good idea if, if, this, if, these, if Joseph's interpretation of your dreams is correct? Girls go, wow, look at that. We had huge bumper crops. This year too, and not just last year. And after that, you go, wow, this guy was spot on, right? Because a great abundant harvest doesn't happen every year. It means what? I don't know. What has to come together, Mike, so you have a great wheat harvest? The right temperature, amount of rainfall, I'm assuming. Of course, you want good soil or whatever. And a lot of our techniques kind of help level those things out through irrigation and fertilization and all those other things. But in the old days, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, so. 
So I guess, you know, I guess I don't have to go get the cow manure. So that stuff does work, but it's mostly nitrogen, so you don't want to overdo it because nitrogen gives you lots of top growth, but not a lot of bottom growth. So in times of famine, that will be bad. Okay, <laughs> never mind. All right, are we ready to press on? <laughs> That's my experience, right? So if you kind of look at the, those of you who have done gardening or farming, you know kind of the three macronutrients, what? Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, or potash, and yeah. Potash supposedly has a reputation for helping roots, and so. And I kind of experienced that just kind of as a child, you know, doing stuff. All right, verses 37 through 45, let's see what happens, because you don't want to hear about stuff I did. I'm not the guy. Joseph is. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said, if it pleased Pharaoh, it will please his servants, at least publicly. All right? Of course, if Pharaoh's a smart ruler, he will want people who will actually tell him the truth, even if he doesn't want to hear it. But that could be dangerous. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Okay. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my host and all my people, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Do you think this is on this, completely on the spot or during part of this? Because remember Potiphar? And Potiphar was part of his security. This, you know, the select security for Pharaoh himself, and he was in charge of that. So it very well could have been that in the course of stuff, he may have had a side table or a side conversation with Potiphar and said, hey, this guy, man, he's good, but I had to throw him in jail because, you know, because you know, I think he was making the moves on my wife. Oh, okay, I, I get it. So that could have happened. We don't know, okay? But... If it did, it would make sense to say, well, why would he, sure, he could be really impressed, but charlatans can really impress people well, right? And so if you're Pharaoh, you've probably met your number of charlatans, right? Because people are always coming up, right? Trying to have you do one thing or another. So you don't have to be Pharaoh that long before you get wise to people trying to use you. Okay, so my personal hunch is I think there was a side table conversation, but it's not, if it's so, it's not recorded, and, and I don't want to say that it did happen, because it's not in the text, okay? So let's continue on, okay? Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around about his neck. What is he recognizing? He didn't take the signet ring off of someone else. He took it off his own hand. So Pharaoh is recognizing. He's saying, I know I don't have the skills and ability to manage all the stuff that you mentioned. So I'm giving this to you. This could really burn him, right? This would be the equivalent of a husband giving his wife a general power of attorney. Right? Don't do that, cuz, right? But So this could really hurt Pharaoh if Joseph is not an up-and-up guy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, bow the knee, Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. So what did he just do? I mean, what happened here did not happen all in two hours, right? So he dresses him up you know, with, with the trappings of power. He takes him out before the people, second only to him to show that this guy now is what? The second in command. 
Okay? So he's doing these things to let people know that he has Pharaoh's full authority and to defy this guy is to defy Pharaoh. You want people to realize that, right? So that way when he comes up, somebody will go, oh, well, who are you? Right? So, um, moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no one shall lift up your hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonoth Panea. Okay, cool name. And he gave him in marriage Asaneth, the daughter of Potiphar, <laughs> priest of On. We don't know if that's the same one, Potiphar, or probably not because this guy's a priest. Could be related, or Potiphar could be a common name, and maybe this is kind of like the official full name, right? So, um, so Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Okay, let's ponder a few questions. What does Pharaoh do with Joseph? Second in command. He's a big dude now, right? Lots of power, lots of authority, and he has the signet ring and all kind of the appropriate dress to kind of show this, okay? So let's look at verses 38 and 39 because I said, what was the miracle that took place there? Because you're thinking, there was no miracle? But let's, let's take another glance at those two verses, right? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, we haven't got that far. Oh, yeah, we have but I have to where I have to find those 38 39. Can I find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? So the miracle is what? That Pharaoh believes. And he believes that God is with Joseph. Not that, not that Joseph is saying the right stuff, but that God is with him. See? So right there, we can kind of see the hand of God working in Pharaoh and that, in a sense, that's like the gift of faith, right? I mean, this happens because of God's working. Okay. So that's a little miracle, right? Okay. And then, of course, you know, what does the name mean? It means God speaks and he lives. So the name that he gives them confirms, right, that Pharaoh believes that God is working through him. Now, Egypt had many gods, right? But this is the God of Joseph. Pharaoh's going to have to learn a lot more about this God. But he knows it's not the pantheon of gods that they believe and worship. So for him, he might say, well, you know, of all the gods, the sun god is really the greatest. So he might be viewing Joseph's God as the equivalent of that. Okay, so the text doesn't tell us all of these details, but we recognize what he knows and believes, okay? God was preparing Joseph to serve in such a way. How was God shaping Joseph through his prison experience, right? He knows top to bottom, right? Yeah, so if all is well, he will, be, he will remain humble, Unless he's one of those so few that now that he's risen in power, he'll like, oh, right? He'll be extra dis disdainful to those who are from the lower, lower parts of society. Some people are like that, okay? Reflect on how God has shaped you in your prison experiences. So, I mean, do we all not look back and go, well, you know, there were some times that were not good. But then we could look back and go, yeah, but... Now that I look back, I can see that God was doing things through that. And you would say, and this was, and I could tell that this is more than me rationalizing that God, et cetera, et cetera. And most Christians usually have some sort of experience in their life where they can go, yeah, yeah. And this even, this even exists in some of the expressions that we say that it's been common enough where, what's this expression? There but by the grace of God go I. Meaning what? Yeah, yeah, see? That God's grace has really hauled us out of a lot of stuff. 
Okay, does that make sense? So yeah, yeah. So Joseph is second in command, and anybody who's going to defy him might as well be defying Joseph. Okay? I'll share with you a, a personal story that I have, just because it's, it's kind of funny. Not really. So when I was in the Air Force, I, you know, my commander, she was, uh, she was, well, I think she, I don't remember her exact rank. She was a light colonel. And um, so, and her XO, which is her executive officer, moved somewhere else, got orders and he moved, and she didn't have an executive officer. So she calls me into her office and say, you're going to be my executive officer. I'm like, well, ma'am, uh, do I really suck at my job? Or, <laughs> you know, because you always think that sort of stuff. And she says, well, no, I'm picking you because I think you're the best person for the job. I'm like, well, there's lots of other officers, ma'am. I mean, do you really want me to Yes, Sergeant Fudrell, you're my XO, and here's what you're going to do, and here are your responsibilities. And I'm like, so if you're an enlisted dude, you're like, oh, great. I'm going to have to tell these officers stuff that they don't want to hear. And sure enough, I did. And I was like, oh, this is not going over well. Somebody would write a performance report, and I'm like, oh, man, what are you, in the third grade? Or You don't say that, but... So you'd go stuff, and some officers would bristle and get offended, and then I would have to say, sir... I'm not coming to you as a master sergeant, I'm coming to you as the XO, and if you have a problem, bring it up to the commander. That was it. But when I went back, when she got her real XO, I thought, oh man, there's gonna be hell to pay. But everybody, maybe except for one or two, <laughs> were all mature enough to handle it in good stride, and it was fine, so I went, oh, good. But I was like, oh, I never wanna do that in the future. So there could be, with Joseph, well, you know, you look Egyptian, but you're not even really an Egyptian. <laughs> I'll outwardly say the right stuff, but I'm not going to go out of my way to help you. And there could be some of that going on, right? So he might have to deal with, well, you know, there could be people who are somewhere in, in the government who go, oh, I'll, just, I'll just bide my time. He's like up there, and if he doesn't please Pharaoh, he'll be gone. So I'll just bide my time and wait for him to come and go. Okay, so we don't know the exact situation, but I would imagine that there would be some of that. Okay, so here we go. Pharaoh, recognizing Joseph's wisdom and integrity, appointed him as the second in command, a vizier, an office of great authority. Great authority. As a symbol of his elevated status, Joseph wore the finest linen and gold. Pharaoh entrusted him with a signet ring, granting him the power to issue royal orders. If you remember the story of Esther, right? How that also kind of backfired at times. Um, this position was not unique to Egypt. Other great nations in the ancient Near East also had viziers, including Babylon, Persia, and later, Israel. These nations understood the importance of having a capable and trusted individual to aid the ruler in governing their vast territories. Now in the US, we don't really have, you would think, oh, well, that would be the vice president. The vice president really is what? Yeah, he's just kind of like hanging out, waiting for the president to die. Well, <laughs> yeah, so, but, but, so this position, so our founding fathers said, we want, power more distributed evenly because we know the corruption to power is pretty powerful. So, okay. Um, so these are some other, like in Babylon, Daniel wore the vizier's mantle, guiding the kingdom with his prophetic insights, right? We know the story of Daniel. And, it's, and so he ends up gaining the emperor's favor because right, of all the stuff that went on. Persia, Esther's cousin Mordecai after Haman. Haman ended up abusing power. Mordecai, it looks like he was getting that way, but we don't know because the story of Esther kind of stops, but we can see the telltale signs of Mordecai beginning to be corrupted. Okay. And then in Israel, a man named Shebna held this esteemed position until his greed led to his downfall. That's in Isaiah 22, so you could read about him. Couldn't talk a whole bunch about him, but he had that position, but yeah. Right, so these individuals didn't only possess power or wealth, they helped shape the destiny of their kingdoms, leaving a lasting mark on history. And so will Joseph, right? Not just earthly history, 
but religious history in this sense that he will be part of what? The ancestral line of Jesus on Jesus' human side. Okay. So this story is like twice as cool because we know all this earthly stuff, but then we also know the big sweep, the big plan that God has and that he, that Joseph will be part of that long line of people through whom the Messiah will come. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. Yeah, which I find to be very beautiful. Because here God wanted a people that was holy and set apart, and yet the very bloodline of the Messiah, who is holy and set apart, is full of unholy alliances in people. Which is what? God who is holy came to save even all the people on his human side who were not. Very good. You're very good, yeah. Judah was the one that the Savior went through, not Joseph. Really? Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Oh, man. I was, you just ruined my flight of fancy. Okay. He's still part of that. Yeah, he is. Not he is. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> Let's continue on. 46 through 49. Okay. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, see, my bifocals are not very bifocalish. Joseph was 30 years old when he, la, 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 turned the page. When he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. What does that tell you? 13 years? So, what? So he was not very old when his brothers sold him into slavery. Yeah, wow. That's kind of disturbing, isn't it? And when you think about that, they couldn't wait till he was like 21. So, okay, anyway. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, and he gathered up all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and put the food in the cities. What's, what, what's the, what, what is that saying? There are these huge granaries or huge amounts of granaries storing grain for the times of famine, okay? So um, he put it in every city, the food, uh, in every city, the food from the fields around it. Now, if you're a farmer, right, and the government's buying up a lot of this grain, it's probably good for you because the stuff that you're selling to non-governmental things, people, companies, whatever it may be, that it means that the price is higher. Because instead of this huge glut where now, oh man, it, the price has dropped dramatically, the government's kind of taking that up. So all the farmers, they're probably glad because it means that their income, it, they're, they're benefiting from this more than selling by volume, okay? So this is probably win-win, okay? Especially during the years of famine. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he ceased to measure it for it could not be measured. So this is hyperbole saying what? Yeah, huge amounts. And, you know, and we can't keep track of it anymore. But it's volumes and volumes, which means that what? The abundance, the abundance was really abundant. And Joseph is really doing this well, okay? I wonder how many mice were getting fat, sneaking into these granaries and, man. You know this happened in this country twice. The what? The, the government built huge amounts of storage and bought the grain. It was under a loan system. Mm -hmm. Bought the grain. Oh. And the price is stabilized as oh. the level the government said. The other side of it, Mm -hmm. When there was a shortage of grain, the 
government released it, and when you oh. had very little to sell, you didn't get a high price for it. Oh. It well. happened twice in my farming life. Wow. Was this, I'm, I'm just guessing, because was this like, say, under President Nixon, Melvin Laird became Department of Agriculture, and he looked at farm like a commodity rather than, was it under Nixon's presidency? I, I, I'm just guessing, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They always have a, an excuse. Yeah. But basically, it's price huh. equalization at a low, yeah. at a low level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I was when I was a another military story, when I was a young man and an airman in the military, and the wages were not good, right? And so after my son was born, we qualified for some our something called WIC. I don't. Does it exist? Yeah. Right. And so there's this list that you can get. But I looked at the list, and it was basically you were subsidizing farmers because you you know you. you Really, you're not, we're not letting you buy a whole lot of processed food. We really want you to buy primarily commodities, milk, cheese, well, bread or whatever. But it's those sorts of things that are more directly linked to our farmers. And so I could see, well, this is a twofer. So you're helping people of low income, but also helping subsidize our farmers. So it, you know, I could see why something like that would happen. But I guess it still exists today from... Okay. Oh, is it SNAP? Oh. Uh. Oh. Right. Yes, yes. Oh. Well, it wasn't on the list. You had to it had to be something on the list. And even the cereals that you bought. No, well, I want Lucky Charms. That's not on the list. It has to be like Cheerios or <laughs> something very plain and mostly, um, mostly grain and not sugar and stuff. So, yeah, it, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what the government was doing. So, so this benefited Egypt, okay? Well, let's continue on, shall we? So we know the, the years of abundance, and so Joseph ma is managing this very well. Now, after seven years, if the bumper crops continue, well, he was half right. Let's continue on. Okay, let's look at verses 50 through 52, and then we're, we'll, we're at the end of the chapter. So, well, we're close to it. Uh, before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my, and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Whoa, okay. So what we may not realize is that these are Hebrew names. So though he was sold into slavery as a, as a teenager, right? Joseph believes in the real God. He's using Hebrew names, which lets us know that even though he may look Egyptian, could pretty, I bet you he could pretty much talk Egyptian with very little accent, okay? I mean, he was old enough where he might have some accent, but not enough where it would really in a sense, betray him, okay? And yet, he's remaining true to God and his people, even though his brothers sold him into slavery. It could have been very easy for him to go, well, good riddance on that useless lot. I'm here now, and I'm going to be Egyptian. And he has an Egyptian wife. Yet, Hebrew names. That's huge. We shouldn't miss that. Okay? Let's continue on. Okay? 53 through 57. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. Bum, bum. And seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. 
There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So meaning what? This is not just, this is a regional famine. Okay? Now how widespread, we don't know, but it definitely, it definitely included, yeah, what would later become the nation of Israel. Okay? When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. Okay, so you remember that one guy uh, seven years ago and I hauled him out in front of you and I said, bow before him because he's the second in command guy and you were like, yeah, go to him now. Okay, so when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened up all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. So that sounds like what Mike was kind of describing, what our government had done. So in a sense, uh, we had, we had, bought up certain commodities in times of plenty and then in times of not plenty? Because I don't, we've never really had famine per se. I guess the dust bowls in 30 was pretty, 30s was close to it. Um, that the government then would sell the commodities or give the commodities based on your situation, right? I mean, there's stories of all these people getting government cheese. I always wonder what government cheese tasted like though. I think it was just big blocks of orange cheddar from what I heard. It was really orangey. Oh, was it? Yeah. So it was, uh, it wasn't real cheese? I think American cheese slices are real. <laughs> Forget it. However, having eaten it, I've always got to believe that the oh. government peanut butter is delicious. Wow. So the government has warehouses of yeah. peanut butter, too. That's oh. Peanut butter. I didn't know that. Yep. Okay. Oh, I want to hear the roundabout story at the proper time. Okay, so, but we need to finish the, okay, yeah. I can say the, so in, the in the military MREs, they have these cheese spreads and, and the, they're packets and you need to need them because the fat will separate from the rest of the stuff, but you need it. And they have bacon and jalapeno cheese spreads. And I'll tell you, it's 10 times better than Cheese Whiz. And I'm surprised that some enterprising company hasn't said, you know, this stuff's way better than Cheese Whiz. Why do people even eat Cheese Whiz? It's horrible. That stuff's great. But it's like, I, you know, I'm not in the military anymore, but those things were good. So who would have ever thought that you would miss stuff? Okay, so famine spread over all the land. Joseph opened up their warehouses, right? Storehouses. Um, moreover, all the earth came to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. So it's not just Egyptians who are in need, but neighboring peoples and nations. It says all the world, we're not talking about Chinese, okay? So we need to kind of recognize what those expressions mean in that context, but it's widespread, okay? And of course, if it's widespread, whose family will be affected? Yeah. Yeah, all right. In conclusion, empty fields replaced seven years of bountiful harvests. Laughter gave way to prayers for deliverance as the famine took hold. Joseph, now the custodian of Egypt's grain, began to distribute it among the people. As the crisis escalated, Egypt didn't only feel the pinch, all the world suffered the sting of hunger and must turn to Joseph for food. So, let us wait for the sting of hunger to affect his family and see what happens. But that will begin next week. Thoughts, questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the, all the stuff written about Joseph is not only interesting, but we can get an idea of how you work in the world, through people, governmental agencies, if we could even believe that. And yet through such things you help provide for our needs. Of course, all of this in a sense was so that the, so that the Messiah would one day be born. But this st still lets us know who you are, the character of you. Let us rejoice in that, knowing that you are a God who 
cares for us, and wants what's best for us, not only in eternity, but here and now. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.